Good Day Western Civ chap, uh, Section 2, Year 2, my apologies. Um, today we're going to be talking about the mid to late 1970s. We got through the Watergate crisis last time. Uh, we, we had the resignation of Richard Nixon uh, as President of the United States uh, and his replacement by Gerald R. Ford. But one important event that happened during the uh, last years of Nixon's presidency I wanted to make sure you knew about was the rise of OPEC, O-P-E-C. Actually, it was originally called uh, O-A-P-C, um, but it's OPEC, O-P-E-C, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries uh, originally, it was the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, and it was originally Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq. So if you uh, look at your map here, you'll see those right there were the original members of OPEC. In 1972, it was expanded to include Libya and Algeria. Then later, it was expanded to non-Arab countries, so Venezuela in South America, as well as Ecuador, Angola, Gabon, and Nigeria in more southerly in Africa, and Iran are all members of OPEC today. This is a cartel of oil exporting countries that try to manipulate the price of oil by limiting production. Now, recently, I'm sure you've noticed, I saw gas at $1.14 a gallon yesterday. That is insanely low. That is far less than half of what it was just six months ago. Uh, and that's because of the COVID crisis and people are not driving their cars. I haven't gassed my car in five weeks and it's still half a tank in it. Uh, so they can't control the price of oil now. And instead, some of them have been gushing oil uh, to try to sell it for whatever they can to get some cash. But the price has completely, the bomb's completely fallen out of a barrel of oil. But in the 1970s, that was certainly not the case. In fact, these Arab countries had come to so dominate the production of oil that they really could, by turning off the spigot to the world's oil supply, drive the price way, way up. Now, in 1973, Israel was attacked by Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, its neighbors, and defeated them very quickly in a war called the Yom Kippur War. And in that war, the United States and most of Western Europe had backed the Israelis against the Arabs, which the Arabs were deeply offended at. They wanted Israel gone. And instead, the West had backed Israel. So in 1973, the Organization of Arab Oil Exporting Countries had decided to boycott selling oil to the West, including the United States and Western Europe. And the price of oil very quickly quadrupled, four times what it had been before the boycott. If you could buy the oil, if the oil could be found, bought, and refined. And that was going to take a long time, if it could be found. And the result was gas shortages all over America and Western Europe. There you see this, this gas station is limiting sales to 10 gallons per customer uh, to try to stretch it out so more people can get gas. That is a line to get gas at a gas station. Uh, eventually, they wound up saying you could only buy gas every other day. If the last number on your license tag was odd, you might have Monday, Wednesday, Friday you could buy. If it was even, a Tuesday, Thursday, uh, Saturday um, to try to reduce the line somewhat. This was a dreadful business. The price of gasoline quadrupled in just a couple of months. And this would go on for a very long time. Um, I wanted to tell you about that because OPEC is still around. They are still trying to control the production of oil around the world. And by expanding themselves beyond the Arab Middle East, 
they have somewhat helped to their cause. But the biggest oil producer on earth today is again the United States of America, and the second biggest is Russia, which might surprise you. You might assume it's Saudi Arabia, but uh, Russia and the United States can produce a lot of oil themselves. And that means that the Arab, uh, well, the OPEC, does not have quite the same stranglehold over our oil supply as they once did. But now to move back to our general story. I told you that Gerald Ford had become the president of the United States. And, well, <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought I could swipe directly there. There is Gerald R. Ford. Uh, he became president because he was the vice president of Richard Nixon. But as I think I explained to you in the last lecture, he was not actually elected by the American people. Normally you vote for president and vice president together. But Nixon's first vice president had to resign from office when he was found guilty of tax evasion. Spiro Tiagnu had resigned he had been replaced by a long-serving Republican congressman from Michigan, Gerald Ford, this guy right here, highly respected, very uh, eminently respectable, honest, hardworking politician, became our vice president, and when Richard Nixon resigned, suddenly in 1974, Gerald Ford is our president. One of the very first things Gerald Ford did was pardon Richard Nixon for any crimes he may have committed in office. That means that there would never be a trial of Richard Nixon for what he had done. And as it turned out, Watergate was just the tip of the iceberg. There were all kinds of unsavory things that he had had his men do. Bugging political opponents, threatening to sick the IRS on them and, and audit their taxes, all kinds of things just for political dirty tricks or because he didn't like people. Richard Nixon accomplished some great things as a statesman, but he was an awful person. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's being judgmental, but they, he did terrible things. Um, and Gerald Ford pardoned him so he couldn't be tried for any crimes. Now, you might imagine this caused a firestorm of controversy. Why did this honorable man pardon Richard Nixon? because he felt the country had been through enough. The, the, the Watergate scandal went on for the better part of two years, and the revelations had shattered the confidence of many Americans in the federal government. And Gerald Ford thought, we already know the kind of terrible things Nixon did. Having a trial and sending him to prison is not going to teach us anything really new. The man has already had to resign from office in humiliation and disgrace. No one is ever going to respect him remotely the way they did before. Isn't that punishment enough? Can't we just move on? That's what he thought, whether you think that's wise or not. Uh, that was what Gerald Ford thought. Now, Ford inherited a country with plenty of problems. The biggest problem was what came to be called stagflation, stagnation of the economy with inflation. Now, normally inflation comes when an economy is overheated. It's expanding too rapidly. That's when you normally get inflation. There's too much money in circulation. Too many people have been earned too much money and they're spending it like crazy and it's driving prices up very fast. That's the normal way you get inflation. It shouldn't be a problem when you have a stagnant economy that can't grow properly, but it was in the 1970s. The reason for it we're now pretty confident was government spending was too high. Federal bureaucracy had grown a great deal. And um, unless you could cut back the size and operations of the federal government some, you probably weren't going to tame the, the beast of inflation. Ford tried. He had a campaign called Whip Inflation Now, but that was really just trying to convince shop owners not to raise their prices, which just didn't make economic sense for them as individuals. So, in the end, Gerald Ford was challenged for the presidency in 1976 by this man, Governor Jimmy Carter of Georgia. 
Jimmy Carter of Georgia. Now, Jimmy Carter was not a major national figure. He became the Democratic nominee by hard work. He virtually moved to Iowa, the first Democratic primary state, a year and a half before the election, and he visited every county and most towns and cities in that state. He got to shake the hands and talk personally to hundreds of thousands of people. And this turned a relatively unknown governor of Georgia into the winner of the first Democratic caucus. Now, one serious contender would come on the scene, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, the last surviving Kennedy male, the Kennedys who had given us John Kennedy, the president, Robert Kennedy, the senator and attorney general had been assassinated. Well, their younger brother, Teddy Kennedy, wanted to be president, but Jimmy Carter won the Democratic nomination. So the 1976 presidential election was between Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford. Ford was sometimes jokingly called his accidency, since he had become president almost by accident. That was counting against him. The economy was stagnant and inflation was high. That counted against Ford. But also Ford was a Republican following Watergate. And a lot of Americans blamed Republican politicians for Watergate. It would have been very hard for any Republican presidential candidate to win in 1976. And yet Ford got moderately close, but Jimmy Carter won. Jimmy Carter won. He was a, a soft-spoken Southerner, very pronounced Southern accent, a man trained as a nuclear physicist, but who'd spent much of his uh, later years working as a peanut farmer in Plains, Georgia, in the south of Georgia, before becoming governor of Georgia. So he, was, he presented himself as a man of the people. He would speak to the nation from an, a lounge chair in the, Oval, uh, in, his, in the residence, not in the Oval Office, sometimes wearing a cardigan sweater to show he was just a regular guy. He was often on TV and the like, not in a suit and tie as all presidents had been before, but uh, but in you know relaxing clothes because he wanted to be to show Americans he was one of them. Unfortunately for President Carter, the inflation problem not only didn't go away, it got much worse. By 1979, inflation was running over 20 percent. Just for your reference, in your lifetimes, inflation has typically been 3%. So the price of borrowing money, which is tied very closely to the inflation rate, was astronomically high. Businesses were hurting. Uh, a loaf of bread, which might have cost 50 cents uh, last year, now costs, um, you know, a buck 50 and things like that. Uh, Americans were very uh, put off by this. This was a serious problem. The economy still was not growing very well. And that is when another crisis hit. Now, this man is Ayatollah Ruhola Khomeini. Khomeini. Ayatollah Khomeini is, was a religious leader of Shia Islam in Iran. And he was a fierce critic of the dictatorial monarch of Iran, the Shah, Reza Pahlavi, Shah Reza Pahlavi II. This religious leader opposed him and everything about him. But uh, unfortunately for the Shah, uh, the, the Iranian people largely responded. America backed the Shah. And eventually, when Ayatollah Khomeini returned home from exile in Paris, he was greeted as a great national hero by throngs of hundreds of thousands. And the army refused to take any action to stop these demonstrations. And Shah Reza Pahlavi II had to run for his life, literally, to escape Iran. This is the Iranian Revolution of 1978-79. And the Shah put in place an Islamic government. Iran is really the only genuine theocracy in the world today, ruled by clerics, clergy. 
the senior leaders of the government of Iran are not elected by the people. They're a council of Shia religious leaders who have the ultimate say on everything. It is headed today by a man named Ayatollah Khomeini, who is not related to Khomeini, by the way. But this revolution was violently anti-American. They blamed us for the brutal rule of the Shah that they had overthrown. They blamed America for overthrowing the government uh, of an elected leader in 1953 and replacing him with the Shah's father back then. So for 20 years, we had backed the Shah and his father, and they had been brutal dictators. There's no way to get around that. And these, the, the Iranian people, by and large, welcomed Ayatollah Khomeini when he came back. Not everybody, but most. And they set up this Islamic government that blamed us for their troubles.